Hello, hello everybody, everybody around the world and the UK, welcome to Truth Proofs live stream. I'm Les Drake from Digital Creations and we assist Truth Proof by getting these live streams out. So I've got to welcome everybody who's coming to the chat early and I'll do a few name checks shortly. Uh, and don't forget, we are the stream that we don't operate any cancel culture here. No cancelling whatsoever. Everybody and anybody is welcome to come on the show and uh, be a guest of Paul Sinclair. So, we've got to thank Deb, uh, Debbie Singleton, who is our moder moderator tonight on the chat. Uh, welcome to the show, Debs. And Andre, if he comes on, he'll probably be on later. If he's coming on, he's our moderator as well. So, welcome, you two guys. Uh, Okay, so sound is good. Yeah, yeah, sound is good. I'm getting, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we just we're just checking there. Uh, we've got to check as we go along here at the start of the show, make sure we do have good sound. And I'm getting good sound there in the chat. That's good. So let's uh, let's have a look. So, first of all, we're going to um. We're going to start off the show as we did last week. We've got a few outstanding questions uh, from the great show that we did uh, with Tim Brennan last week. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to start off with, a, I think there's three outstanding questions here. So we'll bring Paul and our guest on, Johnny Summers, and then I'll, I'll uh, start with some questions. First of all, I'll welcome you two guys to the show. Thank you very much, Les, and uh, need to welcome Johnny Summers to the show. Really looking forward to speaking to Johnny today. I think uh, I think everybody's going to be interested in this story that he's going to tell later into the stream. And okay. It, 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 oh, one sec, Les, it's, it's really good. It's got implications for 1980 and the massive UFO event in Rendlesham Forest. I feel myself it has anyway, so... I think what John's going to tell us will be interesting. So sorry to butt in, Les. Fire away. It's with okay. You. I've got about two or three questions from last week. Uh, feel free to come in, uh, John, if you feel you need to talk about any of these. A uh, question from Valerie was, uh, were the full fighters orange coloured? This is what Tim was talking about uh, last week. As all but one UFO I have seen were orange. So that's a good question uh, from Valerie. It is a good question. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them last week, but the two hours just flew, didn't it? But, you know, I don't think Tim's description of the Foo Fighters or the objects that his, his grandfather saw were orange. But I think a typical description of the Foo Fighters generally is orange or yellow spheres of light, which I find amazing when we're looking at these lights over the sea and on the walls, which I know that we'll touch on with Johnny. And have you any views on this, John? Well, I haven't seen anything orange as regards to Foo Fighters, but definitely Foo Fighters style uh, figures, yeah, in yeah. white, but not orange. Okay, thank you. Okay, the uh, next question was from MKMD, MKMD Exploration and Paranormal. What are your thoughts on HARP? That's H-A-A-R-P. It can control the weather. What else can it control? I suppose. Well, there's a lot of conspiracy and talk about HARP. Obviously, it's real. It exists. Uh, is it um, MKM probably be able to enlighten us better? Is it is, is this the extension of over the horizon radar? Is, is this the, the development after that? And I, I really don't have enough knowledge to to sort of go into it in any detail. And once again, I'll ask, I'll ask Johnny if he's got anything on it. I don't really have a great deal of knowledge on HARP, unfortunately. No, sorry. Okay. Sorry. To let you down on that question <laughs> yeah well i think it's one of them secretive uh, kind of secretive operations it's out there everybody knows it's out there but do do we hell us know what you know what it what it what information it gathers and anything yeah. else yeah so uh good question now uh, question from necklord 88 um do tim and paul think or in uh this week's case does john and Paul think real dis uh, real disclosure is coming with all these released Navy videos. Well, there's certainly a lot of interest. Let's put it that way. I mean, I, I spoke to Guardian newspaper last week and they were asking me my views on it. I mean, I don't know whether it'll ever get to print. And 
disclosure. I mean, are we? Is is it just is it just another another move as as we as we progress as a society and as 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 we're discovering more via the internet via the opening up of people in general just talking more have they got to move goalposts a little bit and just tell us a little bit drip a little bit of information out to us uh, you know i don't think we're going to get full disclosure i mean it would mean admitting that we've been lied to for years and years and years and that's not going to go down well is it you know it's a it's a put a smile on my face but uh, and, a, and a lot of people in this room i think but uh, i don't think we're going to get it i don't what about you john I totally agree with you, Paul. I think uh, everything you said there, I echo it, as well as saying that's uh, very interesting to read the BBC jumping in on the idea. Now, knowing full well, as we all do, the BBC's attitude towards all of this, it's always a bit of a giggle and a laugh. Uh, and reading their article online, not a sense of that at all. So I think the media, if anything, is getting a little bit more serious with this, which I feel helps those out there take it a little bit more seriously rather than being it the the last feature on the program type of thing you know yeah well, yeah well said and any more questions les that's uh, that's all the questions from last week i've just got to remind everybody uh, who's coming on to the stream tonight that if you do have any questions for paul or john please put them in uh, capital letters and uh, debbie can send me the uh, uh, the questions and we can see them more easily also i've got to add that there is a super chat on tonight if anybody wants to contribute to help us make these streams better we also have a paypal on the truth proof facebook page as well on that note i'll let you guys take it away thanks great stuff and welcome johnny summers and Thank you, Paul. i'm looking forward to it as i say listening to you talk about 1980 but i think we should start with things a few years before because they've probably got it not implications, but they're probably linked to what happened in 80. And uh, let's start with the Wold sightings. The East, is it the East Yorkshire Wolds, John? That's right, mate. That's yeah, where yeah. it is. 77, 8 and 9. And take it away, please. Thank you. Well, yeah, the Wolds. I mean, uh, just to give you a wee backstory on how I got there to the Wolds, my family was MOD um, and Army based. And um, uh, they were all and I say all, including my grandfather as well, all transferred up to Leckenfield on the, which was RAF Leckenfield, um, up there on the, on the Wolds, uh, just near Beverly, um, outside of Hull. So to give you a geographical uh, idea, not at, actually, not too far from where you are, Paul, a little bit no. south of where you are. Um, so we, uh, we were moved up there in 1977. And it was March of 1977, if I remember rightly. I've been doing my research on that because my memory wasn't too clever. So definitely March of 1977. And um, up there um, is, um, well, pardon the phrase, very alien <laughs> to where I'd come from because um, I've been brought up in and around Aldershot, which was uh, extremely concrete, um, very, uh, very army as well and um, to be moved into literally the countryside with so much greenery and so many, you know, so much wildlife. It was quite an alien kind yeah. of environment for me, but saying that a very enjoyable time, I must add. So we moved to a small little village that some of you on the chat may know, uh, a small little village called Home Upon Spaldy Moor, yeah. um, which was situated about five miles outside of Market Wheaton. And, um, that's where my first encounter up there happened, um, 1977, actually. How, how old were you? Sorry, Paul. How old were you? Oh, crikey, 77. Um, I was born in 67, so I'll be 10. There 10. you go. Thank you. Um, so I'm up there. I'm trying to fit in, trying to adjust. Um, a guy with a different accent and uh, all the rest of it, you know, bit of a sore thumb um and uh trying to make friends and what have you it was quite difficult at first so i used to spend a lot of time on my own you know billy no mates here like you know so um i used to spend a lot of time in the back garden it sounds a bit weird in the back garden just stargazing yeah. because previous to that yes i have had some light uh, in the sky anomalies so i was just back, back stargazing one day i'm not paying a great deal of attention but the thing that really caught my attention was my mother who was 
at the French windows at the back of the house, just staring upwards. And she caught my, I caught her gaze and I'm looking in her direction and, and I'm wondering what she's looking at. And I, I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary at first. I walked indoors, mum, what are you looking at? What, what, you know, what's up? And she said, oh, haven't you been watching? I thought that's what you were watching. And I'm going, no, what, what are we on about kind of thing? And uh, she then points my attention to this bright white light that um, I at first just assumed it was a star. There was no noise. It was absolutely quiet, dead of the night kind of thing. It's about eight o'clock in the evening. Um, so we watched this bright object go dark, go light, and then go dark again. Well, not dark, but dimmer. Yep. Move yep. to the left, repeat that sequence, light and dark and what have you. Move back to the beginning, into the middle, light and dark, and then do that over to the right, light and dark. Um, this was quite weird, but as I look back on it, the weirdest thing was that um, it didn't scare me at all. All I wanted to do, I felt very tired and I wanted to go to bed. Um, now for a 10 year old that um, wants to go to bed, it's quite unusual, it certainly was for me. Normally my mum would be having to chase me up the stairs to get me to bed. Um, but yeah, man, I, would, I, just, I just felt so tired and I wanted to go to bed. And I don't remember anything after that. I wake up the next morning with a slight recollection of something happened last night and was trying to explain it to, to um, uh, somebody there at the, at the primary school that I was in, in, in Home Upon Sporting Mall. And th they happened to say that someone else had seen something in the sky as well. But that's really all I got. Um, it wasn't until the next day that my mum then told me that my grandparents, who did live in Market Wheaton at the same time, did see the same thing as my mum was watching because she had rung them up on the phone and said, can you see this? Now, I'm, I wasn't privy to that conversation. No. I'd gone to bed, I was tired. So that's my very first kind of light anomaly, if you will, sighting up there in, because we were situated just uh, on the foot of the world's airport, you know. And, and uh, to have... To have Actually, Actually, I think we've got a bit of bleed through. Have you got your speaker on there, John? Have we got a bit of bleed through, have we? Yeah, okay. I can hear myself as I'm speaking. Speaking, But uh, for you to, this sighting to have stopped with you, John, for the best part of 40 years, just a bit longer, a bit shorter period of time. It, everything sounds okay now, guys, by the way. Uh, oh, it, it, uh, it must have been quite profound. I mean, did, did, did your mum speak about it afterwards to you? Did, did, were there any hint that something else had happened? Or is is just have you just got this sort of kind of weird feeling that something might have happened with this tiredness that overcame you? Or I can't really um, say much upon that, except for the fact that it was quite strange that I felt so tired. I mean, I've been active all day. Don't get me wrong. Um, if I if I remember rightly, I think we were off school for a, a week or so, so it may have been Easter or some kind yeah. of term yeah. time. Um, so for me to be out in the garden that time and I would have been different. So that's what I'm guessing. Um, so to no, I don't think there was anything nope. untoward that evening that actually happened apart from the sighting. Um, but nevertheless, it was the first one. Yes, my mother did uh, remember that for quite a while afterwards. Um, there was a time period that she'd forgotten all about it and I had to, me and my sister both had to remind her. Uh, and then it was, oh yes, yes, I remember that now, kind of thing. Um, but on that incident, that's that's really how it how it was, as how I said it, really, mate. So, uh, shall we move on then? Is it seventy eight? Seventy eight, yeah, sure, absolutely. So, nineteen seventy eight, the first uh, situations that I've got here, and I've just I've just got some notes. Forgive me. Um, it was the Christmas of nineteen seventy eight, and um, we've uh, we're doing a, a church mass up on a, uh, a church that sits on the top of the hill at home on Sporting Mall called Churchill, obviously. And uh, it's a Christmas mass. The school have got all of us up there singing a choir in the, you know, in the church for the people who, who are attending. Now, after the mass had finished, all of us kids were sort of like corralled outside, outside the church. It was really cold, but uh, we were told to wait there until the minibus come to take us away. Now, as we were waiting, we got a pretty good night view um, scope of the terrain below us. Um, and someone yelled out, oh, look, helicopters. And I, we, we all looked in the direction that they were pointing. Uh, 
as I recollect it now, very much from the scene of Close Encounters there, where they see the helicopters coming along the ground. Um, it was a little bit like that. And at, at first we were going, oh, right, helicopters. And that's exciting, keep us amused whilst we're waiting. Uh, these things then decided to uh, split quite fast. So they were coming side by side towards the hill at first. They then decided to split. So they went, you know, both that way. Yeah. At a, at a slightly faster speed. But the thing that really caught my attention, Paul, is that if they were helicopters, the light was shining at the front, we wouldn't have been able to see. Um, but we were, be able, we were able to see, is my point. Yeah. yeah. So these lights shot to either side and then shot upwards. So they've gone like this and then they've gone up. And then they're just sitting there in, in, in the sky. Now, forgive me, I'm very rubbish with altitudes and heights and such, so forgive me. But this was a very high hill that we had to uh, climb up to get to the top of the church. And there may be some people in the chat room that might know this place. I do. Um, so, you know. Uh, I, do. I know the church, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, we're, you know, this, the lights were above us. Uh, so, and they were then beginning to come closer. Now, at this point, I'm saying that, that's not helicopters or anything else, you know. Well, we're all transfixed. I, I could estimate, I can't remember completely how many of us were there, but it's definitely more than 20, that's for sure, 20 of us kids. And we're all looking up, we're all transfixed at these lights, slowly make, making our way to us. And Paul, I've got to be honest with you, um, there were a few of them that were getting a bit panicky, a couple of them that started to, you know, a, a bit a bit upset and such, which, you know, but again, myself, calm as you like. Um, oh, they're lights and they're coming nearer to us. And that's exactly how I felt. Um, then they blinked out. Did, did, they any, just, did any of the adults come out? Well, we um, we did have a teacher that came out to uh, see where the bus was, that sort of thing, um, and making sure that we're okay. Um, and he came out and he was asking what we were looking at, all looking at. And he did have a look, but he seemed nonplussed, to be honest with you. Um, and he was then quickly diverted back to the church because something was happening that needed his attention. Right. right. Okay. So with these lights blinking out, um, it was kind of with the kids, if I'm honest with you, forgotten about. No one mentioned it whilst we got, not long after that, I hasten to add, the, the minibus turned up. Uh, well, actually two minibuses turned up and we kind of filed into these two minibuses. And my bus, no one said a word. I mean, I was asking, what do you think those lights were? And all I'm getting is like shrug shoulders and don't know kind of expressions, but nobody said a word. So. The plan was the bus dropped us all off at the school back in home and sporting more and we all live pretty close to the school anyway and made our way home um my my parents didn't attend that particular church mass um thing but um i was sure to tell my mum about it who did express a certain amount of interest i will be honest but um after that it was kind of okay oh well isn't that strange kind of attitude you know but it always stuck in my head, guys. You know, it's uh, any sound. Of... Again, no, absolutely not. That that is the reason, Paul, that I I actually said to the gathering of kids there that there are no helicopters because um, later on you'll get to understand that I'm very aware of helicopter sounds and 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 such. So I would have been aware if it was yeah. a helicopter or something like that, or jet or something. You know, and of course back then there was no such thing as drones or anything like that. So. It's kind of hard to explain them, John. Sorry, sorry, Paul. Yeah, kind of hard to explain. It definitely was, mate. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, yeah. Do you are you have you any more to add to that, or are we going to move on to 1979? Well, um, 78. Just making a look at my notes here because I'm just making sure I've got things chron chronologically put down. That's it for 78, mate. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple here from 79. Um, and I'm not too sure if I'm really honest with you which way round they come. So I'm going to guesstimate, be honest, because it was yeah, a fair few years ago. Yeah. Um, the first one I'm going to go for, and it was winter, uh, again, at the top of Church Hill. 
And us kids from the local villages, we use Churchill as a great big hill to, to do our sledding down once it's snowed. Um, you know, plastic bags or whatever we could find, you know, rubber, rubber rings, whatever it was. And it was great fun, you know. Um, and that's what we did one particular snowy day. Now, it's cloudy, snowy, cloudy weather, you know. Um, we're all having fun. We're, you know, sliding down a hill, very exhausted, getting back up to the top again, that kind of routine. And um, my sister was just, um, we're very exhausted. We just walked to the top of the hill again. And my sister goes to me, who was four years younger than me at the time. So she would have been about six, um, maybe turning seven. And she says to me, oh, look, 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 and then points at the sky in exactly the same direction, Paul, that we saw these white lights at the previous Christmas were two blue lights that were, um, were coming towards us, exactly the same location. And, and I said to her, because she wasn't at the mass, at this church mass before, I then started, I remember I started explaining to her that, oh, we've seen this before, but they were white. Now, me and her we're watching these things as as people do they you know they once people start looking up to the sky other people start looking as well uh, and we had a little gathering of about five or six of us there watching these blue lights now the only thing that i can relate to them in today's technology is not then of course because at that top net the technology wasn't around in today's technology would be led lights that's what they although at the time i wouldn't have been able to explain that no so I'm looking at these blue lights coming along the same directory. They did the same thing, mate. They came along, zoom, like this, and then up, and just hovered there. And they were there, crikey, they were there long enough for people, more people to come along and have a look at. Now, these are people up on the top of the hill, up there to go sledding, have a bit of fun, and more and more people are now looking. Um, I can't tell you how many, but it was a nice gathering, let's put it that way. Uh, and exactly the same thing again, the lights started moving towards us, they started coming forward, and then, poff, they've gone, blinked any, out. Any, any feelings of apprehension? Any feelings, sorry, what? Apprehension, did you feel nervous or...? Not no. me, not me, mate, not me at all. That, that's, that, that's the continuing kind of thing. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying I'm cool with it. I'm not trying to make myself out to be something here. But I've got no feelings of angst, fear, excitement, not even wow, nothing like that. I'm just watching them as as, as if it was a matter of fact kind of event. Yeah, well, I don't want to touch on it, and I'm just diverting you slightly. Let's not, we'll not do this story, but I'll remind you of it if we touch on it, because you had a little bit of apprehension at Bempton a few weeks ago, didn't you? Mm-hmm. But we'll, we'll probably touch on that in a while. Uh, sure. Carry on with 79, John, if there's any more to add. Sure, 79 again. Um, I'm going to go for, it was a bit later, because I think it was towards the springtime. Uh, 79. Um, now, we're... Um, uh, I'm now... Sorry, yes, that's right. I'm now, I'm now at the um, Comprehensive School in Market Wheaton. Yeah. So to get to Market Wheaton from my place, they, they laid on school bus runs. And uh, yeah, you jump on a bus and then when your day of, finished, uh, day of school's finished, they would, you know, chuck us all in the main assembly hall and then file us out to our buses at the end of the day. Now, this is the, in the days there, Paul, when you did a full day's work at school. You know, you didn't finish at flipping two o'clock or whatever it is now. You know, um, uh, we did a good day's work at school, good, you know, a few hours. And yeah, yeah. Um, we're on our way back home on the bus, which did a bit of a dog leg tour around the um, the farms and the homesteads out there in the country before it got to home on Spalding Moor. And the journey would take roughly about three quarters of an hour. We're, we're coming out of Market Wheaton. We've done our little dog leg there, uh, down to an area there that had a, uh, a reform school. It had like a Borstal type school. And the school was called um, St. Williams, I, be, I remember. Now this Borstal school had kids in there that had been a bit naughty, bit of a short shop shop treatment for them and all this. And um, well, we, we had one chap who was allowed out to come to our school to do some extra stuff. So the bus would stop there and drop him off. Well, as we'd gone past that school, heading back onto the main drag uh, to take us into home and Spalding Moor, 
someone yelled out, wow, look at that light. It's following us. And it's to the right hand side of the bus. I'm on the left hand side. <laughs> so I'm craning my neck as you do to try and get a view. And I didn't quite see it at first. The thing that alerted me was the fact that the driver of the bus had come to a stop. He had put his brakes on. Now this, you know, we, we normally got the same driver all the time, if I'm honest. Um, and I can't remember his name, but he slammed the brakes on. And he, I could see with the position of him that he's staring at whatever it is these kids on the right hand side of the bus are staring. So then my interest is now heightened. Again, Paul, I'm nonplussed. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, it's a lie. Okay. All right. But now my curiosity's got the better of me. So I've gone ambling over then to the right hand side, as you do, you know, you know I'm jumping on a couple of the other kids to try and get a good look. And I watch this light. Now it is a little bit more orange than before. It is a little bit larger and it's skimming the trees. And I would say in retrospect now, Paul, that the, that the light would have been about 20 feet in length. Um, and it's skimmed the trees. Now it's about circular. Um, I don't. I can't really say if it's circular, mate. I only saw it profile. Um, but it, well, when you say circular, you mean the shape was a, it had rounded corners. I beg your pardon. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, what I mean is, I can't really tell you if it was a disc or not. I beg your pardon. Um, but it was profile to us. Orange. It was. It was. Wasn't shiny. Really bright shiny bright but it was bright enough to light up the top of the trees um so we were you know looking at this thing it it was it seemed to know that we were watching um and it stopped and i felt it was watching us um again it caused a bit of emotion in the bus there were a few kids that were yelling at the driver to drive um and the driver just got on with it he drove um and as we moved along this light followed us for about a couple of minutes and then disappeared just blink as if you just turn out the light again paul i can't tell you if uh, if we heard noise or not i must be honest with you because of the sound of the bus it was a very old bus it was an old 60s kind of sharabang that they used to put us in you know um very noisy uh well, very cold as well. um so i can't tell you if we heard any noises but uh, again my emotion was non plus absolutely it was like okay yeah all right what time um, of the year yeah it was um so it's a good question because i was thinking about this earlier um it certainly wasn't winter because um the night's drawing quite low at around four o'clock and we had finished school after four o'clock and it was quite light in that respect. So it must have been about spring, maybe early summer. That, that's why we're asking us, trying to gauge okay. with, you know, light conditions. Sure, sure. So that was that really for um, 1979 that I'm, um, I can remember. Um, in 1980, uh, our family moved to Market Wheaton itself. Um, One sec, John. Can we just ask Les if he's got any questions relating to any of these? I don't know no. whether he has. Yes, uh, I do have a, uh, one from uh, MKMD Exploration and Paranormal. Uh, and it's Mike, uh, Mike at uh, MKMD. Uh, he says, My dad worked at Home on Spalding Moor in the 70s. In the eight and in the eight to the eighties, in that time it had an active airfield, but no helicopters were present there. I can ask my dad if he knows of any strange activities. So there's uh, another link with that area from uh, Mike. Yeah, I can add to that actually, Les. I can add to that, mate. Okay. Um, yes, there was a, an airfield around that place, around that area. We used to go as kids because back then you're allowed to go out and adventure, you know, be out on your bikes and stuff. It wasn't that nanny state back then. Um, and we used to go out and we used to go out to this place called La the Land of Nod, if that makes any sense to the, to the lads there. Um, and it was a British aerospace place. One year in particular, we had the Red Arrows coming in for what we were told was a service check. 
and the road ran alongside the, the, the runway. And us kids, was about 10 of us out there, uh, and we watched the red arrows come in. And as they came in, they were giving us a little wing of the wave to say hello. And it was quite nice. And it yeah. was a quite nice event. So, yes, there is a, a strip out there. Land of Nod, I think it's called. British Aerospace used to, um, used to facilitate it. I don't know who does it now. Tim Brennan's just asked, I don't know if you've seen it, Les, uh, what was the name of the hill in the first experience? It was Church Hill, was it? That's right, Church Hill, home and Spooley Moor. Yeah, yeah it's a fabulous location. I can remember passing it, you know, as a child, going on holiday. And, all right. and I'd always look at this spot up on top of the hill. That's why when you said it, I knew just where you where you were. And you, you must have absolutely brilliant views from up there, John. Amazing. We yeah. could see, I'm not too sure if it was Drax Power Station, but it was most definitely a power station towards Selby. That's yeah. how far we could see in a good day. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Uh, can I just, yeah, can I just come in with uh, another one which is uh, related from a uh, 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 question from Wandering the North and uh, the question is, do you think some people are more predisposed to having sightings or perhaps targeted for sightings? That's a good question. That is a brilliant question and, and thanks for asking that because if I may, Paul, can I just give a little plug to my documentary, The Invited, mate? Is that I, okay? I'd like to talk about that. We don't have to jump to the main bit straight away let's, let's talk about the invited yeah well thanks for that question because i do believe that there are people that are not targeted in a, in the sense of anything detrimental but i feel that some people are allowed shall we say or invited to watch or to witness so yeah is the answer to that which is why i've, I've made the documentary the invited and more about that another time well Tell us about the people who who's involved. I, I've I've been lucky enough, and you know I enjoyed a few weekends ago myself and Chris Evers spent. Well, I I, was, I left before midnight. I think you stayed up into early hours uh, with with Chris and and Dave, and we you know we did a bit of an interview, didn't we? And yeah. well, a bit. I think we we talked for about four hours, didn't we? Three or four <laughs> hours. So, that was a fair old stretch, mate. Yeah, we it, saw it really like was. That. But um, who else have you spoken to? Well, apart from yourself, we've got the, the amazing Philip Mantle, who's, um, as you know, has been there from year dot with uh, UFO um, uh, ex, um, investigations with uh, many uh, before and MUFON and all the rest of it, UFOS and all that. Um, so we had, we interjected that around yourself, Paul, over that weekend. So we, we spoke to Philip there. As you mentioned, Chris Evers, amazing guy. A couple of great stories from Chris. Um, he does the uh, Outer Limits magazine, of course, as you know, and uh, conferences and such. So it's a very interesting guy to chat there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then last weekend, we did um, an interview uh, at base, at Zycotica Studio Base, with the amazing Kinsella twins that I know that you've had on your show, Paul. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were very enlightening and extremely lovely chats. And uh, that was really good. So we're lining up more people. I was, um, I don't mind, I don't think he'll mind me saying, but um, Steve Mera, uh, I was on the chatting on the phone to him the other day. He said yes to an interview, which is amazing. Um, and also the, the amazing Mr. Preston Dennett. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of Preston um, from the, uh, he's at MUFON more or less of everything else. And it'd be good to get, his kind of story take as well on, on what, what the phenomena is as well. So it's a good mixed bag. And plus we've got others lined up as well. It, it's going to be an exciting time. Is it, is it pr primarily British researchers? It is primarily, mate. It's set for Preston. Uh, yeah. He's Californian based. Um, but yeah, primarily it is the British look upon ufology and the whole phenomena that um, is weird. That is high strangers, really. Yeah. Well, if there's no more questions, then Les. Yeah, I've just got one actually. Yeah, okay. a quick one from Tim Brennan. I don't know if you covered this one. Uh, what was the name of the hill in the first experience that you had, uh, John? Oh, uh, the hill. Yes, that was Church Hill. Church Hill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that that's good. Um, we we had touched on that, Les, but. Uh, yeah, I thought it, you did actually. We, yeah. We, yeah. No worries. It's 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 emphasised and. Uh, yeah. 
Do you, while we're on with the invited, do you want to stay for a while and, and let's talk about what happened at Bempton because we've got plenty of time to talk about the other things. Yeah. So we, I left just before midnight. Now, I don't know whether you picked anything up on film when Dave were filming us because... I think you, 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 something caught your eye, definitely. And you when, that's what surprised me when you said you weren't unnerved, but you looked a little bit unnerved. So yeah. do, you, do you want to tell us about that or you don't have to? Sure, sure, absolutely. I'm, I'll be happy to. Now, the thing that, as you rightly say, the thing that unnerved me, I think, is because just recently I've had an operation and I'm not trying to make, you know, poor old me kind of thing, but I've had an operation and it's been a little bit just, you know, unsettling for me, okay. if you know what I mean. Um, so I've been on a lot of drugs, a lot of painkillers, and sometimes I get a bit jumpy, you know, every now and then I think it's just the drugs. <laughs> so I was a little bit unnerved that night anyway, that day anyway, if I'm really truthful, I wasn't feeling my best. I really wasn't yeah. feeling on top form. Um, and, um, what it was, we were, we were quite happily chatting away there, Paul, weren't we? And, um, it was a really good, you know, really good interview. And out the corner of my left eye, uh, in the peripheral, I am absolutely sure I saw something quite tall and dark um, walk across my peripheral. Now, it just made me jump. And yep. we're in we're in flow here when I pull. We're talking, which is I forgot what we're talking about, but it was bloody interesting. You got my attention, but this thing had whizzed past me, and I was oh, hold on a minute, what's that? my heart started beating and it's it doesn't do that normally maybe it's the drugs maybe i'm putting it down to this but something actually caught me um quite unawares um parapsychologically wise if you know what i mean yeah, yeah. um i i i sensed um i didn't say it to you guys at the time because i don't really want to sound like a right wally <laughs> but i i sensed the feeling of um everything had gone really quiet and i could it was like um you know when you've got wax in your ears and yeah. you get that kind of frequency buzz thing every now and then i don't know if you guys in the chat room have experienced that but anyway I'd, sometimes i get wax in my ears and then sometimes i get that kind of when the wax pops the frequency goes or something like that um well that's what happened there so i thought oh hello I've got wax in my ears. And this is all in a split second of what have I seen? I'm talking to Paul and I've got wax in my ears. No, I haven't. My ears haven't been waxy for ages. What's going on? All of these things are buzzing around in my head, including my nerves. Now, back, hairs on the back of my neck and everything. It was a real, real shocker. And I can't explain why. I mean, I'm normally I'm not like that. Well, we'd, be, we'd been sat there for three to four hours yeah uh, and <clears throat> obviously it, it were getting dark when this happened i'd got my back to whatever it was you'd seen and i did see you stop and look and then carry on talking then look again so, so it was if it were acting john and i don't think it were by the way it were it were pretty good acting because you did look rattled it, you know whatever. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no yeah. you did you did look a little bit uh unnerved by it i mean i never saw anything i've got my back to you but i find it interesting that you talk about this this buzz uh, uh, this this sound because i think it was last week when when tim were on and we were discussing things and the guy came called alex from california and he'd, i'd said he'd done the skinwalker experience then he'd been to the hoya baku forest and and spent time there and then yeah. ended up at bempton and on his last night, I'll not go into too much detail about it because a lot of people in chat have heard this last week, but on his last night, walking back to where he's camping, early hours at morning, just suddenly sort of steps along and there's a, a buzzing, strange high-pitched buzzing in his, in his ear, his right ear. Steps right. backwards, stops. Steps forwards, starts. Forwards again, it stops. And it's just focused on that spot. So, you know, and this sound... I'm not saying that is what you heard, but but I spoke to Steve Ashbridge about it today, you know, because we were on about something else and uh, his partner, Kelly, she, Kelly, she, she experienced this high pitch buzzing to the point where she had to put her hands over her ears. It was hurting her ears and I was there. I could hear it. Yeah. Uh, Steve couldn't. Only me and Kelly could hear it. So it doesn't surprise me in a way that 
you won't, only you experienced it because as it, it tells us from past experience steve never heard it the, the night that i were up there with kelly and steve i said can you hear this and she could and she wanted to leave it was so uncomfortable the feeling i mean so maybe that's the dissent dis what well, dissent orientation uh, you know maybe that's what's uh, thrown you a little bit yeah i totally totally agree with that paul um, i did feel a little sense of discombobulation if you know what i mean um yeah and, and if you remember, I, I, you know, that's why I stopped talking as regards to our conversation. I, yep. I just needed a break because um, everything had gone very quiet around me and there was a sense of my ears popping and wax or whatever that noise is, but my ears weren't waxy, I can assure you. Yep. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, what's, what's all this? Now, the thing is, um, we haven't fully checked that bit of footage yet. Um, when I say we, Dave, producer, director Dave and I, we haven't checked all of that fully yet. Although Dave has told me that on the footage, um, he, on the audio, sorry, he does hear something crunch quite loudly just before I react. Now, I didn't really? hear that crunch. That's not what alerted me. What alerted me was my peripheral vision and uh, a shadowy, tall, I'm not going to say figure, but something shadowy and tall, um, but, you know, I passed my peripheral. Now, Dave, he's gone, yeah, yeah, do you know what? I can hear that. There's something that's gone crunch. Now, whilst we were talking, I've got to say, you know, we did have some people walking past us. We had to stop filming every now and then, didn't we? Yeah, because they're all looking for the bent and owl, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we got that on bloody film. <laughs> Sorry, my language. We, we got that on film. So, um we thought, right, well, at least of anything, you know, we could get hold of these people and go, well, we've got it on film, do you want to buy it? You know, but um, it was quite interesting to see that at the Benzo now because I then started double checking myself and going, look, maybe it was the owl that flew past and, you know, because they've got a big old wingspan owls, haven't yeah. they? Maybe that's what I saw. Um, and maybe that's what Dave heard the crunch as it's gone into the bush or something or, so we're still going to be analysing that. It's just a case of time factor for us to get into that. Yeah, it but it sure, be that's one to hear it. So, especially, I wonder if it's a static type sound that is heard or whether it's a definite crunch. You yeah. know, because yeah. there's, there's been a lot of strange sound anomalies reported to me from up there. And I, spend, I intend spending some time up there with a guy called Peter Masters, who's really, well, He's got a couple of PhDs in electronics and things, and he's built some equipment. We're off up there in the next few weeks because we'd picked this strange signal up while we were up there that sh he shouldn't have picked anything up. So he's, he's been refining his equipment. So I don't think we're going to get answers to it, by the way, Johnny, but uh, uh, we've got to keep trying, haven't we? But uh, let's stay with uh, the invited and Bempton. Okay. Um, I, I left uh, just before midnight. So. Yeah. Anything happen after that? Yes, mate. Absolutely. Well, um, you and Chris had uh, very kindly uh, volunteered to take some of our gear down to my car, which was great. And off you went. And that's where that's when we saw you last. Now, Chris was waiting at the car and Dave and I were packing up the last bits of camera equipment and stands and everything. I have a notion in my mind to turn around and look out over the cliffs out to the sea. And I can't explain what it was, just the notion. I'm busy packing up with Dave, we've got to get a crack on, you know what I mean? And I just turn around and I see this, this light, it's out at sea, it's above the cloud line. Now the sun had not long ago that gone down, so you did see a bit of residual, um, what they call it, a little bit of residual sunlight coming up over the horizon. So it had lit up the sky a touch and we could see well, I could see the clouds running along the top of the sea edge of the horizon above the sea. Now, this light was sitting above these clouds and it's it's quite bright. And again, I'm thinking, oh, hello, helicopter, whatever, plane, I don't know. It then blinked twice. And that's what caught my eye. I'm like, oh, what's, what's it blinking at? And then it, it, it just seemed stationary. It wasn't moving left or right. Didn't seem to be coming towards, although I will admit, I do admit, it's quite hard to judge aircraft coming at you if they're stationary or not. But it didn't seem to be, let's put it that way. And it blinked twice again. 
So I I just said to Dave, Dave, look at this, look. And the minute he uh, he's like, oh, well, and he's turned around to have a look, the, the light's gone off, it just blinked off. So I laughed and I went, well, oh, something was there, but it's just blinked off. And he, he laughed, he just laughed it off, all right, okay. And then started carrying on packing his gear away. So we just carried on packing the gear and I, I'm curious, it's got the better of me. I thought, right, I wonder if it's, and I turned around, I was like, what, what's going on? I turn around and it's there again. It's done exactly the same thing this time. It's not in the same location. It's it's to the right of where it was, a little bit over towards um, Bridlington Way. Now, I looked at it again. It's done exactly the same thing, flash, flash, and then flash, flash. And I went, Dave, it's back again. And he's like, oh, right, where, where, where? And he spun around really quickly, Paul. And the minute he spun around, it went out. Now this light, it's white, it's not orange, it's not blue, it's not anything else, it's white. Um, and I've laughed and I've gone, I think someone's messing with us. Well, I didn't say messing, I said something else. I think, some, I think something's messing with us. And I, I said out loud, purposefully and intentionally, um, all right, you've had your fun, now fluff off. All right, and that's what I said. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to remember now, that's right, I went back round then to Dave, he's more or less got his gear up and running. I felt a bit guilty because he's packed up most of it. And we loaded ourselves up, you know, to, to get ourselves back down to the car. Now he's walked forward, he's gone forward because he's got the big torch, because uh, now it's dark, we didn't want to be tripping over or nothing. He's walking forward, lighting the way, and as he's doing that, this light comes back on again in the same place it came on in the third time, first time, sorry. So we looked, I looked, I looked, sorry, I looked. And I said to him, look, look, Dave, look, it's back again. The first place I, I pointed, he was as quick as a dart. He was like, to have a look, like that. It went out, Paul, it just went out. It's like, it's waiting for him to look. It's like, nah, 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 I'm playing with you, all right? I laughed, I just laughed and I went, I called it and, and you know, an ucker with an F on the front. I laughed and called it a right ucker, you know, and um, because the emotion had got me and, and I'm thinking, you're messing with us, aren't you? You're messing with us. But I'm going to be honest with you, and that's going to sound bravado. I wasn't I wasn't scared. There was no anxiousness. There was no fear. It was just. Oh, my God. You know, of all the places I'm going to see something, I'm glad I've seen it here. Now this kind of relates me back to the time I used to live around this area and plenty more stories I've got, Paul, that I won't go on about tonight, about sightings around this area. And it was like, oh, welcome home. That kind of feeling, it was quite strange. So we got down to the car, met up with Chris Evans down there, packed up the car and told Chris all about it. And he said, well, why don't we go and have a look? So all three of us then, without any cameras, Paul, you know, yeah. except for Dave's, except for Dave's pretty good camera phone, we chunked on down to the part there where you can look out over the cliffs. It's got, yeah. it's a, you know, the place. It's like a do, board yeah. kind of thing. big railings, yeah, big yeah. railings, yeah, yeah. And uh, I've looked over. We're all standing there. We're there for about five minutes, and we're all standing there having a look, and then blows me. Me and Chris are looking towards um, Bridlington. Dave's looking up the coast towards Scarborough. And um, above Dave, about, I would now, I'm going to guesstimate no more than 100 feet above Dave, this square light just comes on. And I, it was square. It looked like a, it looked like a headlight from an old, from a car. But it's not a bright halogen look. It's like when I say an old car, I mean, before headlights got halogens on them, blinding you to death, it was um, like the old headlight kind of colour. And it came on like a headlight would used to do when, you know, when the old cars used to turn up, uh, you know, put their lights on. It wasn't an instant flash. It was a, a it was a, a quick, bright kind of vroom. It's there. And I've looked at it and I'm going, the first thing that's coming to my head, Paul, was... What's the car doing up there? Right? And I'm, I just laughed and I'm laughing and I'm going, can you see that? And Chris has stood right to my left and thank God he went, 
yeah, I see that. And he saw it as well as me. And the minute Dave turned his head round, it went. Next but, gone. But Chris, Chris has managed to see it. He said he saw it. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he did tell me that, and that's that's interesting. And and this this shape is not the not the first time similar things have been described. Uh, very late at night, that there's a guy comes down and, and spends a bit of time up there, Middlesbrough way, and he'll ring me up and say, if you've got time, we can meet up. And I, I think, well, it's come this far. I'll always make the effort if I can. Yeah. Uh, Uncannily, we were down there when we were doing that interview and we didn't meet up because, uh, and I did know it were him down there, didn't I? He'd messaged us, which were just a coincidence. <clears throat> but on one occasion, I met him, we'll, we'll say it's 11 half past at night. We're walking down, it's November, December time, and above the old RAF base, and this is literally five minutes into our journey onto the cliff tops, a square or oblong shaped light lit up just literally bang just just lit up in the sky pretty much same as you there were a few words that we won't say on a live stream said and i sort of wow and we both stood there going do it again nothing happened we probably stayed up there then till about three four in the morning without anything else happening all night and we walked all the way to speed and you know it, obviously pitch black and and then spent time at these viewing platforms hoping to get an, some kind of experience. And the only one we got were within the first four or five minutes of walking down that path. Myself and Steve Ashbridge, probably back in 2016, stood at one of the viewing platforms, probably the one that you were stood on, looked inland. And I'd, we'd both seen it. And Steve went, I've just, I've just seen a, a light pole at low to the ground, uh, below, the, below the hedgerow. And I went, what, well, it's square? He went, how did you know? And he'd seen it as well, and we'd both seen it. And I and I, I did a little sketch of it in Truth Proof too, what we'd seen because it were in the, it must have been moving up because that, where I saw it, although we're in the same stretch of field, they, they must have been hundred foot apart. And he's saying I saw it there, and it was square. So well, I saw it there, kind of thing. And we've we've had a similar experience with Andy Ramsden, but it's strange that it's a square light that's yeah. it's been been reported. But there's also all sorts of, I think. The UFO phenomena, the light anomaly, is a massive thing, a, a thread that runs through it all. In it is what what lies behind these lights that I find intriguing. You know sure. that that that's Les. Just before we run to a little bit of a break, have we any questions? Let's have a look and see if I can get through. If there's any more come through, I don't think we've got any uh, through at the moment, Paul. No, but no. I'd just like to say. I'd just like to say thank you to everybody who has uh, put questions in today. And uh, and thanks for everybody who's uh, come on the stream. And especially thanks for the super chat that we've received tonight. Yes, yeah, very, very good. Thanks for the support, guys. And uh, I'm reluctant to start the Leckenfield story because I'd like, I'd like it to run. So Yeah, we well, can run to a, a break if you like, guys. Yeah, are you good with that, John? Yes, I'm fine. That's great. Okay. okay, see you in a couple of minutes.
okay um 1980 and i'm i'm in a situation there um, I'm with the Army Cadets and I've just been transferred from the Market Wheaton Army Cadet Branch over to the Beverly Army Cadet Detachment um, for, um, well, for reasons that, you know, I, I just needed a change, let's put it that way. And there was a scope of promotion, which I got in the end and stuff like that. So off I trundled um, and... Um, um, you know that that's just how it is and and this was 1980 I'm uh, 1980 I would have been uh, well, 13 years of age and um, I'm kind of um, making my way back and forth over to Beverly as best as I can you know buses and stuff like that which hindered me quite a lot being of a young age and um, you know, I had a great time over there so I've got myself settled in with the boys. Um, we used to go out and do all of lots of different kind of uh, maneuvers and such. And very much um, being young, young lads, um, try to break as many rules as we possibly could, you know, being kids. Uh, one of the rules we used to do, one of the things and the things we were told we shouldn't do that we did was to try and get on to the um, Leckenfield base which by that time was now taken over, well and truly taken over by 1980, by the Royal Corps of Transport for their, for their beginning stages of uh, driver training wing up there. So um, I just need to set out the layout. Um, the area in which we, we, I'm gonna use the word infiltrated for the sake of a word. The area that we infiltrated was the um, south side of the base that had, um, the uh, allotments attached to it. Now, I was very uh, aware of the allotments area because my grandfather had an allotment patch there and on a Sunday I'll be doing the allotments with him. So I knew the area really well and I knew a, little, a few places that we could hide and not be found and everything else until we really wanted to get into the base for our little adventures. Because one of the things we used to do uh, and, and honing on our camouflage skills, being in the Army Cadets, all sounds silly now, but back then it was quite a bit of a, a serious thing because we're trying to get our, you know, our next badges and all the rest of it for us. It's rather like uh, the same situation for Cubs or Scouts. So we used to have camouflage equipment. Now these would be camo nets, all kinds of camouflage bits and pieces. Um, painting ourselves black on the faces, you know, real Rambo style, Arnold Schwarzenegger style kind of looks, you know, a bunch of right prats, I must be honest. But anyway, we thought we were cool. So we used to try and infiltrate the base without being caught. Now, this was great fun for us. We had great fun doing this for many, many, many months. Um, it's coming up now, it's it's winter. Um, and um, I, I do remember that it was, not long past um, Guy Fawkes night. So it's November, uh, it isn't quite December yet. So it's between that period and December. And it's really cold. I'm not gonna be honest with you, it's really cold. At one point we were thinking, oh, we've had enough of this rubbish now, we're gonna clear our home. You know, because um, my, uh, my friend's older brother used to pick us up and take us back home, you know, because he used to be down the pub, even though he was drinking, he would pick us up. So we'll be all there, all cammed up in our gear, taking a wander down to the outer perimeters of the base, getting ourselves ready, and then seeing how far we could get into the base without being caught. Now, yeah, in the past, we'll get caught. The, the RMPs would come out and, you know, someone would have said, oi, have you seen those wallies over there? They think they've camouflaged and they're invisible, but we can see them, that sort of thing. Uh, so we learned how to, develop our camouflage skills even more and that sounds ridiculous so we're there this november and we've come into the base and we've infiltrated the first part like i say by the allotments and we've come along and then it gets to the bit there where we got down into the ground and we're slivering around the floor and we're trying to be all roughly tufty there's three of us uh now i'm not going to be giving the other guys names because i have spoken to them today actually that um and they've at my last attempt to try and get them to agree to have their names mentioned and they still won't um so i um I, so there we were the three of us and we we're making our way through 
One of the lads was the same age as me. The other lad, he's two years younger. All right, so he'll be about 11 coming on to 12. But the, the other lad who's the same age as me, and we're crawling along the floor, and I've got the idea then of digging foxholes. Uh, so we've got one of those little army um, spades that you, you can fold up and, and what have you. And I've got that in my backpack and all this. Let's dig foxholes. That would be good. We'll be right little army blokes then, won't we? That sort of thing. And we got about digging up these foxholes that we could get into. Now, foxholes, if you don't know, are little trenches that the um, fighting forces use to bury themselves into the ground so that they can cover themselves so that it won't be seen. So we're doing all of that. We're digging these foxholes and we're getting in the foxholes and we're covering ourselves up. We're thinking we're really clever. Well, we've managed to get a little bit further into the base past the allotment now and we're up and up to what was the old runway the when it used to be the RAF Leckenfield and a runway is still there it wasn't used or if it was we certainly didn't know, see it because they had a, um, a an assault course rigged up the army boys have rigged up an assault course that run along the side of the runway so if it was still in use it'd be a bit precarious for any aircraft landing that's for sure so that's why I'm saying it wasn't in use, because I really can't imagine it would be. So we've got ourselves as far up to this sort course. We're thinking we're right clever now. We've never been this far before. Uh, you know, we're right on top of ourselves. And then um, the youngest guy, and I'm going to call them Tom and Jerry, just for the sake of a name. Tom being the oldest guy, Jerry being the little one, okay? So Jerry goes to me, John, look, look. And he points up to the sky and there's this white light. And I'm, okay, I'm nonplussed, all right? Like I said before, and I've gone, all right, yeah, I'll see loads of them. Now, Tom, the guy, the other guy there, he's been with me a few times when we've seen lights because we used to go out camping at different places and on weekends, again, trying to be all army barmy and all the rest of it, thinking we're clever. So he's used to seeing stuff with me. Now, Tom, he turns around to Jerry, <laughs> these names, he turns around to Jerry and he goes, oh, we've seen loads of these, Jerry, no behave yourself, what's the matter with it? And he laughed it off like I did. And we buried ourselves into the ground again because there were some squaddies that were walking around the perimeter. They weren't doing anything to try and find us. They were just there and they were in uniform and we thought, oh great, this is great bait. Let's see if we can wind them up. Well, they just disappeared. And this light is still up in the sky. Now, I can't, I'm, not, I'm, I'm pretty rubbish at altitudes, guys. I'm so sorry, but it was quite high. Um, but brighter than a star. Now it started to move and it started to come towards us. Now I'm then going to, um, I nearly said his name, man. I'm now going to, uh, to Tom. Well, that's not a helicopter or anything, is it, mate? And he's going, no, no, he said, it's silent. Now I'm reliving this speech bit because, guys, I've been on the phone to him today. So we've gone through this today. We've relived this today, both Tom and Jerry and me. On a tri call, we've relived this today, so I can give you a little bit more clarification as to what they actually said, even though it was back in 1980. Now Jerry goes, "Oh no, that's not a that's not a helicopter," and I went, "Well, what is it then?" And he went, "It's a King UFO." Now I, I'm, you know. Tom's laughed at him. He's gone, oh, don't be so stupid. It's one of those lights that we see all the time. It's not a UFO. And he starts having a go. What is it? Aliens? What do you think? Oh, and all of this and starts having a go. Now, young boy there, he starts getting upset. He starts getting um, quite fidgety, quite aggravated and starts, you know, starts, uh, I wouldn't say crying, but definitely getting quite emotional. So we're laying in these foxholes and we're looking at this light and it's getting nearer and it's getting nearer. And then it stops and it stops um, just south of the, uh, the runway, if I remember rightly. Now it's just motionless there and it's a light. It's no shape, it's just a light. Um, shining quite bright, but not dazzling, not blinding. And it starts to move, I'm not saying along the runway, but in that kind of direction by a little bit diagonal but definitely towards us. Now, as it's moving towards us, I then turned to Tom and went, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And he went, yeah, I'm definitely seeing this. He says, it's triangular, isn't it? And I went, yes, 
it's a triangle. Now, this is the first time I've ever noted anything of any discernible shape. Now, I know when I was talking about that shaped rounded thing on the bus when I was younger, yes, that was a rounded thing, but now this has got defined shape. It's triangular, guys. It's, you know, um, and it's moving towards us and it's getting lower. Now, I would say it's six foot estimate roughly six foot off the ground and the reason i know that you know I, i've always i've been about five ten whatever since the age of about that age 13 i haven't really grown any taller since then or might have shrunk but anyway it's coming in and i'm guesstimating that's my height or just above my height and it's coming in silent as anything it's gliding in and the young one there he's now crying okay he's getting very emotional very upset and he's going to us i want to go home I want to go home, I want to, and he's continuing, it's repeating it. I want to go home, I want to go home. He's slightly behind us and he's tugging at our camo nets to say, come on, I want to go home, I want to go home. Um, we're, we're like, you know, um, Tom, he's, he's turned around and he's gone, yeah, okay, all right, we'll be gone in a minute. Me? No, mate, I'm not going anywhere. If you guys want to go, you go, I'm staying here. I wanted to watch this thing. I, was, I wasn't scared. I was a little bit... Um, perplexed, if you will, because now I'm making out a shape. All this time I'm seeing lights in the sky. Now I've made out a shape. The curiosity factor, I think, is now got the better of me. I do remember there being an absolute silence uh, in the area. Uh, that was that was a little bit unnerving because I, well, um, because I will be telling you that you know because of the proximity of where we were, we could hear cars from adjacent to the base uh, driving past and things like this um, and um, all sorts of you know, wildlife in the nighttime kind of sounds all of that are gone it is, it is silent now i'm watching this triangular thing glide along and it comes within 15 20 feet of us and just arcs around our location and then goes further outwards then to our left where we was uh, where we were situated and hovers above the um the um i said it before the the allotment area now my, i said to you before my grandfather's got an allotment there and i'm thinking it's heading for granddad's allotment <laughs> and i said that to the boys i said it's heading it's heading for my granddad's allotment and i joked with some i was reminded today by tom that i joked about something like it better not squash his potatoes it'll go mad <sighs> Or, or something like that. And um, I'm reminded about that today. I couldn't remember that before. So this thing hovers above the ground and then it settles itself down. And as it hovers, it oscillates a slight touch. And we can now see that the triangle is in fact a pyramid shape. It's a three-sided pyramid shape. Now, I'm guesstimating again that it's no higher than a say about 10 foot high. Width-wise, I would say roughly the same. Possibly, I'm still not too sure, but it was no. It wasn't a real massive thing. It was, you know, it was roughly about that size. Now we're looking at it, and we're, we're you know, the young one there, young Jerry, he's now crying. He's now getting upset, which has then heightened the anxiety of the other guy I'm with, Tom. Okay, he now stands up and gives a, a, a load of obscenities. He's, he's freaked out. He's gone. He's stood up. He's shouting at all the mother whatevers you are and all the C's and the B's and all the rest of it at this thing. I'm still nonplussed. I'm just looking at him, losing his, losing his plot, watching young guy there, you know, literally going to pieces with emotion. And I'm not. Uh, not because I think I'm a roughly toughly hard nut or nothing like that. It's just void of emotion. Again, um, it's a very discombobulating period. Um, I'm feeling I'm here, but I'm not here. I'm watching this thing. Um, and then adjacent to this thing, in the background, we see the RMPs and they're in, they're in two Jeeps. Now with the Jeeps running on concrete, it makes a quite a wearing kind of whiny sound. And you know they're Jeeps and it's coming up the up the uh, concourse there um, and, and along the road. Um, and they had actually cut across 
the parade ground, which I don't think people are allowed to do that. But anyway, that's what they had done. So taking a shortcut, they get onto the road to get in our direction. That's the thing that scared me. I'm scared about getting nicked by this lot. So I've then yelled at Tom to get down. And I'm yelling, get down, get down, the RMPs are coming. I'm not worried about this triangular thing. I don't care about that, honestly. He's, he's yelling and he's screaming. I've managed to pull him down. And I'm going, shut up, we're going to get caught. Now, as soon as these um, the, these RMPs come up, and there's two Land Rovers. Now, the back Land Rover stopped uh, just as it got onto the roadway, whereas the front Land Rover carried on going. It had It had the driver and four other people in it. The driver stayed in the vehicle and the four other people got out. Um, they didn't have weapons or anything. They had long sticks. I had batons. And as they got out, well, before they got out, I beg your pardon, this is the important bit. I'm losing myself here. Before they got out, the triangle, the pyramid just turned itself off um, and disappeared. In fact, it was quite weird. It was just, you know, bang, it's just gone. Now, I'm used to lights just disappearing. I've seen this before, I'm, you know, I'm an old pro at this, you know, but um, I'm looking at the lads, young Jerry there, he's gone, he's at, he's shaking, he can't, he's, he's out of control. Um, Tom, the older one, he's angry, he's really wound up, but then all of a sudden he's just stopped, he's frozen in his track, or laying down, he's frozen. And I said to him, you right, I said, oi, to Jerry, behave yourself, pack it in, we're going to get caught, they're going to know we're here and all this, I'm like, not shouting, but, you know, husky, whispering, sort of. Now, he's kind of calmed himself down. I said to the older guy, you all right? He's going, yeah, 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 and all this. So we just laid there, laid there, and it's about two or three minutes we're laying there, mate, and uh, these RMPs, they're, they're searching around, they know this triangular pyramid thing had been there, they must have seen it. They must have seen it. And they're driven up to where it was. They weren't driving to our location. They drove to where the pyramid thing was. And they're out and, they're, and they've got their sticks and they're, they're, they're brushing um, some of the bracken away. I don't know why. And, and they're, you know, they're doing stuff with the allotment, poking at things. And the young guy there, Jerry, he's lost it. And he starts crying. And when he cried, it was a burst of emotion. And they all, 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 th all four of these guys, these young, they weren't old guys, these squaddies, they were young guys. They all spun around to our location. They just looked at us. Now, they gingerly and carefully walked up to us. Now, they, I'm not saying that we were clever, being all roughly tough, we all covered in things, but they had a trouble seeing us at first. And um, it was young Jerry there that gave the plot away. And I think at first they thought he was on his own because it quite startled them then when both Tom and I um, made ourselves know we stood up and they were a little bit startled. They were like, oh, oh, oh and all of this, you know. So I camouflage words. <laughs> so um, we stood up and uh, they were going, they weren't cross. That was the weird thing as well, Paul. They weren't cross. They weren't angry as we would have expected them to be. They weren't giving it all the big ones. They weren't frog marching us off and, you know, giving us all the aggy. Nothing like that at all. They were very gentle, very kind, and very courteous. Now, their first person that they, they got to was young Jerry there. And one of the RMPs crouched down and said, come on, mate, you're all right. Come on, come with me. And... Um, I'm looking and the older one then just says, helps us up. No, sorry, the older one and, the, and another guy helps me and Tom up. And um, I'm trying to take the cam net off me and trying to get everything together and everything else. And he's helped me, you know, he's helping me get all my stuff together and, and put it back in the pack and everything else. They weren't angry, they weren't annoyed. Um, and then they said to me, you know, what well, I said to us all, come on lads, you're coming back to the gatehouse. And, uh, and I've gone, oh, that's it. We're all in trouble now, are we? And that sort of thing. And he went, no, 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 you're not. No, no. Yeah, I think it's cold, isn't it, lads? Are you cold? Do you want a cup of tea? Cup of, you know, do you want a can of Coke? That kind of thing. And of course, like young Jerry there, he's like, oh, yeah, 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 I'll have all of that. They gave him a hanky, you know, wipe your nose, son, get on with it. And put us, not forced us, just gently guided us to the back of this second truck that they have motioned up. So they hadn't radioed the second truck. They kind of motioned it up with their hands like like this. The second truck came up, 
and um, which had two RMPs in, one of which was a woman. And um, they put us in and very gently and calmly and very nicely drove us back to the uh, gatehouse. Now, we're at the gatehouse at the front of the, the guardhouse, the gatehouse. The guardhouse was near the gatehouse, I beg your pardon. Um, and first we went to the guardhouse and then one of the lads, um, one of, it was um, a ranking NCO, I think it was a corporal, said to the others, this is a bit too much, isn't it? They're only kids, let's put them in the gatehouse. So then they, they calmly walked us to the gatehouse. At any time we could have done a runner and I don't think, you know, they would have been, they, nothing they, they could have done to have stopped us. But we walked very calmly and gently into the gatehouse and they were asking us our names Ah, right, the game's up, innit? You've got to tell them. So we told them, told them our names. Um, and what, why were we there and everything else. So we, t we just said, look, we're out for a bit of adventure, you know. We're trying to get our, our next badges for our army cadets. And, and they were like nodding as if they, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, we got you. We understand, yeah. You do know this is out of bounds, don't you? And he says, and all that. I said, and I went, yeah, so, but that's half the fun. And he laughed. He was like, yeah, all right then. And he just laughed it off. Now, as they're like, making notes and they're uh, and, and they did make notes, made plenty of notes, and they're taking our addresses down and, and phone numbers. Um, they um, were, were being very hospitable. Cups of coffee, cup. I had a cup of tea. Uh, cups of I believe uh, young young Jerry had a cup of coffee. I believe, and me and um, Tom had a cup of tea. Uh, looked after very well. Are you warm enough, boys? And all of this, uh, anything? But well, we put the heater on. We got the heater on in here, and they moved the heater and things like this. Couldn't be nicer. Got our parents' names and phone numbers, and then started ringing. You need to come and collect that sort of thing. You need to come and collect them now. Again. Young Jerry, he's more interested, he's more, um, he starts blubbing again, and sorry, not interested, he, he's more fearful of what his parents would say. I think it was his dad that come and picked him up. And they met the parent at the front, of, they didn't let them in the base, they, they met them at the gate, and then they called uh, who, which other's parent it was to the, to the front of the gate. And without any, any fuss or, or whatever, escorted, him out to his parents so I, I didn't know quite what the reaction was with his dad or anything else like that so then there's me and Tom left and then um, um, they they asked me they said well your surname because um, no, my surname was different to my stepfather's um, and uh, we, we, we can't seem to find all of that you know we can't are you sure you got uh, you're telling us the truth son and all this and I'm going yeah yeah honestly you know and I'm, yeah, and I'm trying to convince them that, you know, I'm, I'm being sincere. So um, they then um, managed to get hold of my stepfather because my home phone wasn't ringing. But they managed to then ring the, the other number that I had on me because I always had my numbers on me. Uh, and they managed to trace, trace him down to where he was at that time, which was work related. So he was called out. He then made it back to the base, but bef um, he, he, he turned up before Tom's parents turned up. And it's only from past uh, post conversations with Tom that I found out that it was his dad that came and picked him up, but I didn't see that happen. So my stepfather turned up and um, he, um, he was very cool, calm and collected. I thought he was going to lose his plot with me, if I'm really honest with him because I know I bloody well would have done, excuse me. But um, the RMPs, they were like, they, 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 didn't treat him the same as I thought they were going to treat him. It was a case of, oh, right, sir, okay. And uh, they, they, they kind of stood back and um, it was right, sir. Yeah, and there was a bit of reverence towards him. Um, obviously, I'm not going to go into details about what he did for a living, but it was MOD. So they had a bit of reverence towards him and um, that was that really. They kind of let me go. Um, I'm in the car and he's, I'm expecting to get a load of grief from him now. Not one bit, not one touch. He drove all the way from Leckenfield back to Market Wheaton. Um, and um, the whole of that journey was hardly you never said anything, except for when we were getting to the top of Market Wheaton, there's a hill there called Harris Hill. And you drive down, and at the time it was quite a steep hill. We're driving down and uh, he slows down and then he goes, we're not gonna speak any more about this when you get home. This will not be spoken about, do you understand? And I went, yeah, 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 okay, Dad, yeah, sure. And I, and I looked at him, and he, was, he wasn't he was cross. He, he was, you know, 
just looking forward and, and concentrating on the road, I guess, but no emotion from him at all about this. And um, well, um, I, I've got home. My mother's at home. I don't know why she didn't answer the phone, but she said she didn't get a phone call. The phone didn't ring. So I, I don't know. I, I haven't had, you know, I, I've asked her a million times since then, are you sure the phone didn't ring? And she's going, no, the phone didn't ring. You know, it's in the front ring with us. You know, um, the house phone, I mean. You know, it was in the front, it used to be in the front room. Um, but then, or, or in the front room, or in the, in the um, um, uh, corridor outside the front room, it all depends on where they pulled it, pushed it. But that's, that's where it was, um, and it didn't ring. So she was a bit, well, what you did? What's all? What's all this? Why have you brought him home like this? What's going on? You know, what's happened? Because you could see I was a little bit, you know, I don't know what's going on, and I had to tell her what it is I saw and what I was doing. Now, the thing is, on my way home, Paul, Les, is that my stepfather never asked me once what had happened. Not once. Not not even what was I doing there? What do you think you're playing at? All the rest of it. Not once. Um, yeah. Now, I have spoken to him about it since, as I've got older, you know, grown up and what have you, got my own bills to pay and my own way in life. Um, I've asked him about it. He's, he was always that kind of, well, you know, I can't say, but, you know, it's that kind of thing that really, John, you shouldn't have been there. You know that. And as far as I'm concerned, that's all we're going to talk about. All right. And he just used to leave it like that. That's it. Yeah. End of story. Never anything to do with what were you doing there, what do you think you were up to, or, or anything like, what did you see? Uh, and my mum did ask me a couple of times about what I said I saw. Um, and there are other stories that I could tell, and I may do in the documentary that would validate, validate that. But uh, at, for this particular thing, she never asked anything at all so uh, that's my Leckenfield uh, experience and story there guys um, well hopefully I'm we'll not... be able to, I'll be able to hear what you guys are saying so I'll shut up now and hopefully we'll be able to hear what you guys have got to say first of all can can John hear me can Les hear me and can the people in the chat hear us I'm obviously John can't no uh, John can't John can't hear us uh, Paul but uh, I'm here right well basically guys uh, some of the things I would have liked to have asked John if, if he could have heard us was what colour the light was because I've already gone through the story with him and I can tell you it was white and he he does think there's implications to Rendlesham Forest as well uh, as, as I do but it, it's just a pity that we can't have this interaction because uh, I think it's quite an incredible story and I could have probably coaxed a little bit more out of John. So I think at some point we need to do this one again. Um, I'm, I'm sure that our listeners and other listeners would, would agree because, I mean, it's the first time it's, it's sort of ever been told, first-hand account, by the witness, you know, all these years later, RAF base, perimeter of an RAF base, RAF Leckenfield, November, late November 1980. And I think the implications are profound when we're talking about a pyramid shaped craft. It was just a pity, sound issues. I have no idea why, guys. And I've not much more I can add to this, Les. Yeah, well, um, can I come in here, Paul, and ask uh, you a question? Yeah. And obviously, I'd be asking it to John if he was, if he was able to hear us. But. How important the date that it given, how important do you think it was to the Rendlesham uh, Forest uh, incident? I, I think it's immensely important. And uh, I mean, it, it makes you wonder if, if other military bases or other military installations around the UK, around the world even, were touched by the presence of this, this what we'll say is a true unknown. I mean, John said this thing came down landed within, well, moved within 15 to 20 feet of them and then landed a short distance away, had the ability to just switch on and switch off. Some of the descriptions that, are, that he's talking about, excuse me, and its movements don't sound, sound dissimilar. Totally silent. You know, yeah. I think we've heard Colonel Alt say, this is weird. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it, obviously these were young lads that have experienced this. Uh, what, he, what John doesn't touch on, 
is that when they were being interviewed, and I know he's told me that I think the word UFO was mentioned by one of the boys, not it wasn't John, and uh, there were there were a little bit of discussion about that, and obviously his his immediate family didn't want to talk about it, and I, we've got to respect that. That's that's up to John, and I'm talking here, and the guy can't hear me, so I don't want to say anything out of turn, but. No, I think it's immensely important. We're we're on a, we're on the edge of a military base back in 1980, late November 1980, and I think the significance it's it's uncanny. We might be at the other side of the country, but uh, I think there's implications and connections. Myself has uh, I know you can't speak for Johnny, but uh, has has this account been uh, put in the public domain before, Paul? No, no, it's a first. John, John's not doing this because of the uninvited. Sorry, guys. The invited. I think we give Nick Pope a plug there with his book, The Uninvited. John's not doing this because of the invited, his documentary. I've known about this, and I've probably touched on it on live streams and various podcasts for about 18 months to two years. But I didn't want to go into great detail about it because I wanted John to be the first person to tell it. It can't be better than listen, listening to this from a first-hand witness. Now, there's some questions here. I don't know if we can get John to answer them. He's gone. <laughs> Just... He's back. Ah, right. Can you hear us, John? Can you hear us? I can us? hear you now, man. Superb. Well, I've, uh, what I've done is I've jumped on the phone. Yeah, well, we'll just address a few things, John. What colour was this object? You've gone again. You've gone again, John. No, I can hear him. No, He's I'm there. here, mate. Can you hear He's me? Right. What colour was the object? The colour, um, it was a white, it was an opaque white. Opaque. No. It wasn't okay. bright white, it wasn't, you know, brilliant or neon white, it was an opaque white. You, you, what you're doing now, John, is you're echoing some of the things I've just spoken about for five minutes while you were in silence because, you know, and when when you when you guys got taken into the the room and spoken to by the the military personnel the, the word ufo were yeah. mentioned once what by one of the boys weren't it yes yes it was it was like uh um i forgot what set in context it was but um one of the um one of the one of the one of our well the three of us um and i think it was the younger one uh said something like oh we saw a ufo we saw a ufo and um, it was kind of like, well, I wouldn't say nonchalantly ignored, but it was it wasn't a kind of what did you say, lad? What was that? It was nothing like that. It was a, a kind of acknowledgement of, but without a, um, an audible acknowledgement, if you know. Yeah. Um, they they just didn't seem to be that shocked. As I said before, they definitely went to the area of the of the pyramid rather than coming to find us they they didn't know that we were there um well if they did they weren't coming to our area no. that's my point uh, one more thing and i've just said this to the listeners so i'm sorry for repeating myself guys but i, I want I, I want to stress that john's not telling this story primarily because of his documentary the invited this story I first told to me probably two years ago by yourself john and i've touched on it a few times in live streams and podcasts but i wanted you to be the person to tell it so it's the first time it's been aired and you know what do you think its implications are john for for the other big case of december 1980 well it's very strange isn't it i mean obviously it, it took me a, a, a long time to make the connection, if I'm really honest, because the whole, if I, well, okay, the whole Rendlesham thing, guys, was not in my radar until, well, early 2000s, if I'm truthful, if not mid 2000s. Um, yeah. So right up through that time. Although I will say, you know, when I say not on my radar, not as far as investigating, I was aware of Rendlesham um, through the latter through the mid to the mid 80s onwards because of other situations that I'll go into at another time. But um, as regards to investigating Rendlesham, no, I, I, I wasn't, wasn't that, uh, uh, you know, up, up no. to date. Um, 
I, firstly, I must apologise, guys, for the quality of my phone camera here. It's absolutely rubbish. But... Well, 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 don't, John, because at least we've got sound and we've, we've got this interaction now, haven't we? And I, I'm just glad that we can put these questions to you. I don't know if anyone in this chat has had any questions that they want to ask, Les. Has anything come through to you? Yes, um, let's have a look. I think you've already asked one of the questions, but we'll uh, let's have a look. Uh, I think okay. We'll talk a bit about <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, did I ask this question, Paul? Just remind me if I did. Uh, from wandering the north, it's my opinion that much talks about USA reporting to UFOs uh, slash UAPs will talk a lot, but say very little. What does Johnny and Paul think? So it's about the USA and the report of the UFO, uh, UAPs. Uh, me, me personally, I think I think he's probably right. I don't I don't think they're going to tell. It's kind of they'll tell us what they need to tell us. Do you know Do you, you know what I mean? I know we, we, we're going over the same ground, and I, I bet people within the UFO community, we're all kind of saying the same thing. I know there will be some people who put their hands up and think we're going to it's, it's going to be something like the second coming that we're going to be listening, you know, hearing about but I don't personally think it's not. I'd love to be corrected I'd like to be wrong but I just think we're going to, we're just going to be told enough to satisfy us until our, our curiosity, our knowledge widens a little bit more and we'll have to be told some more. I don't know what you think John um, I think you're right, Paul. I think you've got it on the hit the nail on the head there, mate. Um, they're definitely not going to give us anything of any substance except for what we already know, but possibly a few little tidbits like they have done already with, you know, a few, shall we say, I like to call them, uh, you know, prominent plants that get invited into the into the uh, into the circle. Um, yeah. Like we've already had the exposure of to the Stars Academy. Malarkey with uh, Tom DeLong and 182 kind of guy. You've just gone again, the jump. It's gone on in the past. Hasn't really done a great deal. Exposed to a few things but as regards to the few. I just thought, no, not a link, what's going to be. And all of this kind of circus kind of routine, that's not a bad change, I don't think. I think you're right. Yeah. Les, anything else? Yeah, that's uh, some great answers there, yeah. Uh, here's uh, a perennial question, I guess, uh, is how many types of aliens do you think there are? I, I how long, think asking, how long have we got, guys? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, well, no, it won't, it won't take long for me to answer. I haven't got a clue. And I, and I don't want to sound sarcastic when I say that, you know, because you, you see sort of charts with lots and lots of different pictures and of types of craft. And you see other things saying there's all these types of aliens. I really haven't got a clue. And and if if there are, then yeah, fine. I, I've just no idea. And and then when you've got the people who've amassed all these types of aliens, how do they actually know? Yeah, do you know what I mean? I'm not I'm not putting down the hypothesis that the aliens are here or these these beings are here. Else I wouldn't have wrote night people. But I've only had my kind of experience and my interaction. Uh, and that's kind of a, a one-off for me anyway. So, so the people that say that there's 20, 30, 40, I wonder how they actually know. Have they seen them all? I mean, or, or do they just believe everybody? In which case, I'm as bad. Believe me. You've seen the descriptions that I've put in Night People. Well, one thing I've not said, by the way, and I, I get punished off Don Lodge. Uh, not punished, that's the wrong word to say, but he always tells me, plug the books. So the books are available on truthproof.uk or on Amazon, uh, you know, because I'm all about people, and I think everybody knows that, and Les is the same. When we've got his guest on, primarily tonight it's Johnny Summers, and we want to hear John talking. So, But let's throw the question at John then, the aliens. How many types? <laughs> what, what type? Well, I've seen a few weird things out there as regards to are you an alien, I must be honest with you, but um, I don't think there are... Oh, I'm going to really put the cat amongst the pigeons here, guys. I really don't think that there are that many if uh, visiting, let's put it that way. I think it's dimensional, and I think it's spherical. I think it's parapsychological more than anything else, if I'm really, really honest. Um, 
aliens, little green, little grey men. Yet yeah, millions of sightings about those. Um, you know, books, thousands of books are written about them. No disrespect to those that write them. I just think that some of these authors need to uh, jump off the gravy train and go and do something else less boring instead. But saying that, there are reports, of course, and plenty of people out there in the ufology world who are making a lot of money from telling you what they want you to say, what they want you to hear, I beg your pardon. Yeah. Um, so good question, really good question. My honest answer is I don't think there's that many. I don't think we've got nations upon nations visiting us like it has been said. You know, there's apparently 20, 40, 50, 100 different types. As you rightly say, Paul, who the flipping hell's documenting all of this? Yeah, right, you know? great. Yeah, some honest answers there from, uh, from you too, great. Uh, Jim Louise Barry asked uh, um, about your Leckenfield story, John. Was it a solid triangle of light? Well, I think you already covered that, but if you want to just go through that again. Definitely. It was definitely a solid triangle there, guys. Um, it had shape and definition, for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just one more, Les, because while I'm on with this, I'm interested. The light that it emitted, did it light the ground up around it, John? It did underneath. Once it got nearer to the ground pool, yes, it did. But um, as I said before, it's roughly about six to ten feet above when it was flying into us. It didn't illuminate then. Um, yeah, but my, it my, down. my reasoning is, we, we, well, let's just picture a normal torch. We put that on on, a, on its wide beam and it's going to illuminate a large area of ground. This is a, an illuminated object, ten foot tall, we'll say ten foot by ten foot, three three sides. Did it illuminate a large space? That's what I'm meaning. Not the area, of, because the lights off Bempton don't seem to light up this, the area of sky around them. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's a really good, really good way of explaining it, Paul. Uh, it's because when it came down to the lower part of the ground, yes, it did slightly illuminate, but no, nothing like a torchwood or a beam of light or something along those lines. No, no. Thank you. Les? Yeah, uh, um, question from Bobby Dazzler. Uh, has Johnny had any MIB, Men in Black, experiences due to his interest in the subject? What a great question. Thank you, Amanda. That is a great, is a great question. And um, if I say yes, I'm just about to go and put my silver foil hat on. No, uh, no joking aside, um, not MIB, no. Not MIB, but... Um, uh, because my research has been extensive, I have had, shall we say, curious, curious in, um, onlookers, let's put it that way. Yeah, but not MIB, no, for sure. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, I've got a question from Tony Worrell. What were the IMA guys looking for before getting the lads? Do you understand that question, uh, John? Yeah, when the first uh, Land Rover turned up, they saw that triangle, I'm telling you, they must have seen it. Um, it's not as if it was. It's ten foot tall. It's ten foot wide, as Paul, Paul said. I can't. I can't honestly say that what they came to look for was potatoes in a in an allotment. They were looking for something that was all that they saw. They saw it. They weren't streaming down the concourse over the uh, parade ground to get to us. I'm telling you, they were trying to get to whatever it was that had come down. You must have just read my mind because I was. I was just going to say, what kind of speed were they travelling down that? Oh yeah, they were fast. They didn't hang about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and obviously they went straight. One of the Land Rovers went straight to the spot. Yes, the first one did. The second one held back, and that was only manned by two people. Now that was quite strange because they didn't know that we were there. So whatever they thought was was there. That was, in my thoughts, recollecting afterwards, probably what the second Land Rover was for because it only had two people in it one male and one female um, RMP. Do you know, John, what did, obviously it's a long time ago, but what did you think when it vanished before your eyes? Because it's, I'm thinking it's almost holographic. It's, it, it's dematerialized anyway, because you said that they were swishing those sticks about. So there's, yeah. nothing, there's nothing solid there that they're touching that they can't see, is there? 
I know, not at all. Uh, what did I think, mate? I'm going to sound blasé. I really am. I do apologise if it's... But I was, I'm used to it. I'm used to lights blinking out. Oh, it's another bloody... Sorry, my language. It's another light that's blinked out. Mm. Oh, I've seen, I've seen, I've only given you a small account of silly lights in the sky here. But I've, I've, just in case it went on and on, I've got sheets and sheets of this stuff that I could read off which, you know, my partner's mm. telling me I should write a book, <laughs> you know, but um, I don't know how you do it, Paul, I really don't, I haven't got the patience for it, my man, but um, yeah, but yeah. I'm used to seeing lights blink out, mate, I'm used to it, it's a kind of thing that happens. Just, just aside from that, I, I really need to say as well, because I haven't done, uh, and I know Les probably would have done, but thank you, Deborah, for doing moderation in chat today, as always, brilliant help, really appreciated, and uh, Let's speak to you next day or so, but thank you. And Les, have we got more questions? Yes, a uh, question from Nathan Lockley. Um, he's, he's kind of uh, reiterating what was said earlier. He says, definitely an interesting question. If the military personnel were aware of the pyramid, uh, what were they looking for on the ground? Yeah, hi, Nate. Nice to see you there, mate. Um, I've got no idea. I mean, they were swishing their sticks about... Uh, that's what perplexes me. What do they think that they could find? I don't know. But um, they were scanning, definitely scanning the area of which this object had come from. Well, let's, let's face it, though, Les and, and John, isn't that something that we'd all do? If you'd just seen something in front of your eyes and it's disappeared, you would kind of go, where is it? But, you know, but I've just seen an interesting question from, let's have a look, Tony Worrell. Uh, it's not in caps, Tony, so do them in future in caps if you can, please. So, so were, were the allotments inside the base? I'm confused. Aha, right, yes, they were slightly inside the base. They were set up on the perimeter of the runway, um, and they were slightly inside, yes. They weren't in inside, interfering with all the operations and such. They were just slightly inside one of the um, outer perimeter guard gates. Yeah, great question that because I've not thought of that, Tony. Thank you. And and am I right in thinking, were they for military personnel these allotments or civilians as well? No, as far as I know, they were just for the uh, military people that worked on base. Who so that kind of ties in then, to, uh, Tony, with what what John's saying. Yeah, thank you. Well, let's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll move on to uh, Nathan. Nathan. Oh. Nathan again, and uh, he's asking, what is your opinion on uh, Louis, Louis Elizondo trying his best to keep, to help our cause or a government plant, or is he a government plant spreading misinformation? Good God, I, 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 I don't know, I don't know, I mean, I don't know, I, I can't untangle truth from lies, and I don't mean this guy's lying, I think he's, I think he's, my personal opinion, I think he's trying to get the truth out. Oh, you can you hear me, John? Yes, I've got you back now, mate. Yeah, yeah. Did you hear Les's question? I did, yeah, yeah. And what's your opinion? Yeah, you might have to ask it again because it's gone a bit wonky. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Go on, Les. Okay, what's his, your opinion on uh, Elizondo? Elizondo's, uh, is, tr is he trying to help the cause or is he spreading uh, misinformation? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I remember that. Right. Yeah, he's 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 an interesting chap, isn't he? Um, making threats that if uh, things don't get through, he wants to get through to Congress to release information and all that, blah, blah, blah. I don't know how many, I've lost count of the amount of people that have promised that one and never come clean. You know, Jimmy Carter was one of them, wasn't he? he oh, as soon as I get in, I'll, I'll explain everything back in the 70s. And there's been a lot of them since. Um, and not lots being done because obviously if there is going to be something that's leaked they've lost their jobs and they've got no money coming in you know a lot of these congress people rely upon the funding so that won't happen uh, um this guy he seems quite it, it it wasn't he not some kind of connection if i remember rightly with to the stars academy um because um with the tom delongs and all the rest of the others you know because there was a little bit of all of that that just seemed a little bit too showmanship for me. So to answer your question, yeah, I think he's a bit of a plant. I think he's definitely there to set some story straight that, say, some of the uh, three-letter agencies 
want us to believe. Let's put it that way. Right. It's a convenient. It's a convenient mouthpiece. Uh, I don't know. Have you seen the question, Les? Or do you want me to read it? Do you think the military spotted anything on radar? I guess it might be a good for some of these. Have I read your question, Les? <laughs> it still, might in, still in my thunder there, Paul. Uh, uh, sorry, mate. I apologise. Um, it, but it might be good for some of these people in the chat. Let's. I, I don't I, save me a job. File some freedom of information requests, guys. Let's let's yep. see if there's anything out there for Leckenfield. You know, there's too many researchers just want to sort of hang on to all this. I like I said, I spoke to you two years ago about this, and I, I just touched on it in a few podcasts. Not because I didn't want anybody to know, because I wanted you to tell the story. Do, do you know what I'm saying, John? Yeah. Probably... Yep. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, I think we're we've got a few technical issues, guys, and yeah, I think we're going to leave it for tonight, guys. We are into the end of the two-hour session. It's been as good as we could get it tonight. We do persevere when, when there is technical issues. But yep. on this occasion, uh, John is so faint, he could be a million miles away. And I've, yeah. I've, Listen, the main thing is, we got the story out, and it was well worth listening to. You've been really entertaining, John. I've, I've really enjoyed speaking with you, and I'm, I hope we can do it again. Yeah. Okay, I've got to thank you both then, Johnny Summers and Paul Sinclair for That's Truth Proof. Okay, yeah, and uh, we'll speak to you again for sure. John, would you come on again? Definitely. You, stop, you try stopping me. <laughs> thank you very much. And, okay. and Deborah, thanks for doing the moderation. As always, much appreciated. And everybody in that chat, thanks for the sport, guys. Okay. Yeah, then there we have it. Um, thanks for staying with us. We had all those technical issues, as you saw, but we're pretty, yeah, uh, we persevere. We persevere with these things and we carry on, as you know. Thanks for everybody who has come on to the chat tonight from wherever you live in the UK, around the world. And as, as Paul rightly said, thanks to Deborah Singleton for doing the uh, moderation tonight and keeping all those. Uh, iffy people off there but uh, on this channel we don't get that many so great credit to you all thanks for the super chat uh, that I saw come in thank you very much and it all all this remains for me to say it's been a great show and we'll see you all next time see ya <laughs>